Hi, uh, my name is Michael Chan. I'm a, a clinical geneticist working at uh, Westmead Hospital where I run the adult uh, genetic metabolic disorders service. And as part of that service, we look after a number of patients with trimethylaminuria. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, underlying biochemistry of trimethylaminuria as well as the genetics and talk a little bit about uh, primary and secondary trimethylaminuria and uh, uh, talk about treatments as well, although uh, I won't be talking much about the diet. Uh, dietitian side of things, as uh, I know Kate Billmore has been talking, will be talking about that and presenting on that. So uh, what's trimethylaminuria? So it's uh, a biochemical or metabolic condition characterized by a fishy odor. Uh, some say that it resembles that of rotten fish. And the actual fishy odor itself is due to the excretion of a chemical called trimethylamine. And for people with trimethylaminuria, they excrete that compound in uh, body fluids, urine and sweat, as well as on the breath as well. Um, it's important to note that uh, people with trimethylaminuria are normal and healthy people. Uh, they don't have a shortened lifespan. They're not at risk of any other particular health conditions occurring to them uh, at an increased rate compared to the general population. However, uh, for people that do have trimethylaminuria, then the odour often results in social and psychological difficulties um, uh, because we know that uh, having a, an unpleasant odour associated with you can cause psychological distress um, throughout life uh, and through childhood as well as in, uh, in adulthood. Um, so it's definitely a significant disorder, even though it doesn't cause a shortening of, of lifespan or other morbidity, the psychosocial problems associated with this condition are, are real and significant. So the odour associated with trimethylaminuria uh, can actually be episodic. It can fluctuate, comes and goes. Uh, a lot of that's due to dietary intake uh, of the various precursor compounds. Uh, but we also know that there's variability around the time of menstruation uh, where it increases uh, or for women who are on oral hormonal contraception. Um, so there's certainly fluctuation in the odour. Interestingly, not everybody can smell it. Um, so most people are able to smell uh, the trimethylamine, uh, but a proportion of the population can't. Uh, I, I personally actually don't smell it very well at all. Um, uh, whereas some of the other people I work with find the odour quite strong. Um, trimethylamine uh, is uh, a fairly simple compound. You can see here that the chemical formula of it uh, is a central nitrogen atom surrounded by three methyl groups. And this is the compound that uh, has the odour associated with it. Now in our bodies, uh, when trimethylamine uh, comes through the blood uh, through to the liver, the normal process of metabolism uh, involves an enzyme called FMO3, uh, flavin containing uh, monooxygenase type 3. That enzyme that lives in the liver normally converts trimethylamine to a different compound called trimethylamine N-oxide. Uh, and trimethylamine N-oxide doesn't have an associated odour. And you can see the compound's pretty similar. The only thing that's different is this oxygen uh, atom sitting over here. So that's what's normally supposed to happen in the body. In the body. So where does trimethylamine itself come from in our bodies? Well, it's made uh, in the gut and it's predominantly made by the bacteria that live within the gut. So uh, the sources of uh, Precursor compounds are lecithin, choline, trimethylamine oxide, which you'll remember from the previous slide is the, is the compound that doesn't smell. But those things come into the gut and are metabolized by bacteria and converted into trimethylamine, which is the compound that does have an odor associated with it. So uh, where do lecithin and choline come from, uh, as well as where does trimethylamine oxide come, oxide come from? So lecithin is a food additive. Uh, it's a fatty uh, compound uh, that's used in medicines. It, it's used as an emulsifying agent. It ma makes products last longer. Uh, it's found in uh, large amounts in fish oil supplements. 
Uh, so it's a commonly found compound. Uh, the second uh, group of compounds that get turned into trimethylamine is the trimethylamine oxides, and they're found essentially in seafood, so in fish, in things like octopus and squid, and in crabs and prawns and things like that. So uh, seafood can be a source of trimethylamine oxide. And lastly, uh, choline uh, gets converted into trimethylamine, and that's predominantly found in, veg in certain types of uh, vegetables and offal, so, uh, as well as in eggs. So you can see there the various products that it's found in. It's also found in what are called the brassicas, which are Brussels sprouts and broccoli and stuff. Um, so, but interesting, these uh, vegetable products, not only do they contain choline, but uh, they also inhibit the natural uh, MF, FMO3 activity. So they're sort of a double whammy, so to speak. So there's different types of trimethylaminuria. They're so-called primary and secondary trimethylaminuria. So primary is the genetic type. And uh, that's the type of trimethylaminuria that, uh, that I'm uh, predominantly involved in caring for. And this is due to a genetic defect in the FMO3 gene. So if you remember back to the slide where I showed that trimethylamine uh, is normally supposed to be converted from TMA into TMAO uh, in the liver by, the, by this enzyme that's uh, coded for by the FMO3 gene. Now, the underlying genetics of FMO if, of primary trimethylaminuria is that it's what we call an autosomal recessive condition. That means you have to have a carrier mother and a carrier father, and when they have their children, uh, they are both required to pass on the faulty gene in this diagram, the little r, down to a child. So an affected person has two versions of the FMO3 gene that are both faulty, a faulty one from their father and a faulty one from their mother. So they don't have a working copy of the FMO3 gene. So that's the underlying autosomal recessive inheritance of trimethylaminuria. There are, however, many secondary causes of trimethylaminuria, and these are uh, situations in which uh, TMA is uh, overproduced, but it's not due to an underlying genetic defect. So uh, there's acquired forms, predominantly due to liver failures. So people with hepatitis or cirrhosis can uh, produce too much trimethylamine. There's transient forms. I've already mentioned uh, mentioned uh, the transient increase in, in TMA that comes with the menstrual period, uh, but also in early childhood, the FMO3 enzyme is a bit immature and doesn't really work properly. And if you add to that any infant formulas that contain a large amount of choline, for example, then there's the potential for uh, that child to overproduce TMA. Um, if you give too much choline just as a supplement, uh, there are some people that are on it for various health, con health concerns, then you can overwhelm the FMO3 enzyme in the liver and produce too much TMA. Uh, additionally, there's the uh, forms where TMA is produced uh, in the mouth. So various bacteria uh, can overgrow in the mouth. So forms of gingivitis or uh, types of halitosis, uh, and those bacteria can produce TMA. Uh, that's not ex not gotten rid of by the liver. And lastly, um, if you have an infectious uh, cause like urinary tract infections or vaginosis can produce too much TMA that uh, can again overwhelm the liver FMO3 enzyme and produce too much. But these are all forms of trimethylaminuria that are not uh, due to a primary genetic fault. These are secondary. So how do we make a diagnosis of trimethylaminuria? Um, uh, what we do is a process of asking a patient to have a choline-rich meal prior to testing, and then we measure the urinary excretion of TMA. And there's two different ways you can look at urinary excretion of TMA. The first one is as a percent of total TMA. So how much TMA is in there versus how much TMA plus TMAU. And if more than 40% of the trimethylamine is in there as unmetabolized trimethylamine, 
then that indicates that there's severe trimethylaminuria. 10 to 39% is mild trimethylaminuria. And anything under 10%, we consider to be within the normal range. So if the total trimethylamine is, you know, 5% TMA and 95% TMAO, then that's a normal result. The second way of looking at urinary excretion of TMA is uh, just looking at how much unmetabolized TMA there is. And uh, if there's a urinary output of something like 15 to 20 milligrams per day, then that seems to be enough, like a threshold for the presence of the fishy body odor that is a, that uh, uh, that characterizes trimethylaminuria. So in a nutshell, uh, the diagnosis is made by urinary testing after a choline-rich meal. Uh, now, to determine whether this is primary trimethylaminuria, then you need to have firstly the increased urinary excretion of TMA, but you also have to find genetic mutations in the FMO3 gene to confirm that's primary. Um, if it's not if you don't find the two mutations, then you're likely looking at a secondary cause of trimethylaminuria. Now, some genetic changes um, confer residual activity and they, they uh, might result in a milder form of the condition. Uh, and I won't go into the details there, but there's various different genetic combinations known that can cause disease. Um, so when we do go looking for mutations in the FMO3 gene in patients who have been shown to excrete too much TMA, then in fact, a lot of the time we don't find mutations and those patients are thought to have one of the many secondary forms of trimethylaminuria. In terms of genetic differential diagnoses, we've already sort of talked about uh, things that can cause trimethylaminuria that are not genetic, but there's actually two other genetic conditions known that can cause an unpleasant body odor. Um, the first of these is dimethylglycine dehydrogenase deficiency, extraordinarily rare with only one patient reported that I'm aware of. And just newly reported is a thing called methane thiol oxidase deficiency. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that is a condition in, in which the body produces too much of a compound called uh, dimethyl sulfoxide. Uh, again, associated with sort of an eggy smell. Um, neither of these conditions are particularly easy to diagnose at this stage. Laboratories aren't really set up to do so. Um, finally, just moving on to treatment. Um, dietary management really involves reducing the amount of lecithin, choline and trimethylamine oxide in the diet. And I know that's been really well covered by Kate in a separate talk. Other Management approaches include the use of activated charcoal. Um, this, uh, in a sense, detoxifies the gastrointestinal tract and uh, absorbs uh, trimethylamine from the gut before it can go into the bloodstream and into the body. Uh, a similar approach is through the use of copper chlorophyllin. Uh, it's the same sort of idea, essentially. Uh, Thirdly, one can take antibiotics. There are some antibiotics that don't get absorbed into the body and, and uh, will travel through the gastrointestinal tract and really sterilize it in a sense. So, uh, for example, metronidazole and neomycin can be used. We don't really recommend that this approach gets used uh, uh, often uh, because as uh, we're becoming increasingly aware, the bacteria within the gut are actually part of our body. You know, the, what's the so-called gut microbiome is really important to health. And so killing that off is not necessarily a good idea. Uh, but you know, some people do use that approach, um, uh, for example, leading up to special social occasions. Uh, we also recommend that people wash with low pH salts and uh, pH soaps uh, and uh, lotions. And the reason for that is at that sort of pH, very little of the trimethylamine exists as a as a volatile compound that can be that can uh, go off into the air. So the low pH soaps seem to work quite well. And lastly, uh, the use of additional riboflavin can be a useful adjunct. And the reason for this is that the enzyme FMO3 needs riboflavin to function properly. So if you give it a bit more riboflavin, sometimes that will help. So I'd just like to finish there and uh, just uh, lastly here is uh, the contact details for our clinic. 
Uh, we have a specialized uh, dietitian, Kate Billmore, but we also have uh, myself and Dr. Yusuf Rahman as the consultants in inborn errors of metabolism. We have nurse specialists and uh, we have a rotating metabolic fellow. So thank you so much for your attention and uh, I hope this talk has been useful.